Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is from the 1986 film Dolls. This is one that's been on my list for a while and I've been meaning to get to. It's been very hard to find it in places and I think actually the most recent issue of the Blu-ray that I think was through Scream Factory is actually out of print now. So if you want to own it, sorry. Uh, this is a fun film. I don't know if this is one that I feel like I need to own. I might have to give it a second watch just to make that ver uh, just to verify that for myself. But I do think this is a film that kind of falls into two categories where you can kind of watch it as a more serious, like creepy type film, or you can also watch it as kind of a so bad it's good type film, which you don't find often those films that kind of walk that line and can be viewed both ways, even though there are plenty of films I rate both ways. So this one will get that same type of rating. But this one, it's interesting because there's enough of it that's actually good from a film perspective, but there's enough of it that's actually bad as well to kind of straddle that line, which just doesn't happen that often. Um, it's an interesting film. I've seen a lot of buzz about this online, probably because it hasn't been able to be seen anywhere on streaming really, uh, but Shudder just recently put it up. So when I'm doing this review, I watched it on Shudder. It is available on Shudder. Don't know how long it'll be there, but check it out uh, because it's Dolls and it's done by Stuart Gordon and it's produced by Brian Usna, who, you know, those two work together quite a bit in their career um, to varying uh, levels of success. This film actually did not have a whole lot of success, unfortunately. Uh, like I said, directed by Stuart Gordon, and this came right after he and Yuzna did Reanimator, and it came out the same year it, he released uh, From Beyond, which actually, side note on that, apparently they used the exact same set they built for Dolls and for From Beyond. They shot Dolls first, and while all their post-production and everything was going on for Dolls, they were shooting From Beyond, so the films ended up coming out at the same time, but Dolls was technically done before From Beyond was, but they used the same set, and this was actually a multi-level set. It was actually two levels. I know a lot of the times sets will be on one level, and then it'll just kind of be like, oh, we're in this room. Oh, now we're in this room, and they're different sets, basically, or different rooms with, within the set. This one, they actually built the two levels, which is something that was done with um, Evil Dead as well. Actually, Evil Dead 2 is when they did it. They didn't do it for the first one. They did it for the second one. Uh, so that I just think that's kind of interesting information. It was written by Ed Naha, who also wrote scripts for Troll. Now, I'm talking not Troll 2, the infamous Troll 2, which I highly recommend people watch because it is horrible. But the original Troll, which actually is not a bad film. I think it's pretty solid. I actually have it somewhere back here in my collection. Uh, I will probably watch it and review it at some point. There is horror elements to it, but it's kind of more of like a fantastical sci-fi-ish thing as well. Actually, the, I have a DVD that's the two-pack of Troll and Troll 2, so well worth owning that, in my opinion. Uh, Naha also wrote the script for Chud 2, Bud the Chud, which I have not seen yet. I've seen the original Chud, uh, but I will get to Bud the Chud at some point. I hear it's not good, but just so you know. He was also involved in writing the script for Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and I know that Stuart Gordon and Brian Usna were also involved in writing that script. Now, Bunty Bailey, she's the person who plays Isabel in this film, who doesn't last super long in the film, and has that great kind of uh, look of the grown-up doll where her eyes pop out and she holds the, holds the eyes up, which, by the way, that was not originally going to be in the film. That was pulled from their kind of poster concept. Uh, but uh, Charles Band, I think, who, who was the main producer on this, had said, look, I want something like that to actually be in the film. If it's on the poster, I want it to be in the film at some point. So that's why they did that particular scene. Now, anyway, Bunty Bailey, she didn't do a whole lot of acting, but she was the good-looking woman in the AHA music video Take On Me, if anyone remembers music videos when they were actually a thing that people cared about. So, just uh, interesting. So apparently, the speaking of the poster, which I already kind of threw out there a little bit, the poster and concept for the film was created first, which is typically not something that, that happens that often, but, I mean, obviously that can help in, in selling an idea like that. Then the script was developed after the idea was thrown out there. People were like, yeah, you know, killer dolls, it can be a good one. Uh, apparently post-production for this one was quite long, mainly because all the stuff they had to add in after the fact with the dolls moving, all that kind of stop motion with the dolls, which I think they did a really good job with, in my opinion. 
Also, I was not expecting them to throw as many dolls into the film as they did because, let's be honest, they didn't need to. You know, think about something like A Puppet Master, which Charles Band was also involved in making. Um, that's a film that there are some of these killer dolls, but there's not that many. So, like, it, it wouldn't take as much time. It wouldn't take as much money. They didn't have to create a ton of them, and it was very effective. I think it's the same for, for this film, but for some reason they felt like they just wanted a lot of dolls. So I say kudos to that because I think it definitely adds to the film. It's just they could have had the same degree of success with this film without putting all that extra time and money into it. But, you know, watching it now, I really appreciate that they did put that extra time and money into it. But apparently the post-production took forever. And during that time where they were trying to get everything done with the dolls in post, they were also, they also decided that there wasn't enough gore to the film. Initially, there was really not that much gore, so they ended up doing a lot of extra takes to insert in while they were editing it to add gore to it, which I'm thankful for that too because you gotta have gore in a film like this. Like, you really need to have a lot of gore in a film like this because it's a ridiculous concept. Let's be honest, it's not a great concept. It's not a great film. That's why you have to have the gore. You have to have a better selling factor. Just saying. Uh, the dolls in the opening credits of this look legitimately creepy. That's another thing. The actual design of the dolls, not just the fact that they did so many of them, they look like they kind of straddle that line of being, looking like they would be actual dolls and looking like they've been created to be these demonic things. So great design on that. And to start the film out, especially with that kind of like creepy, kind of childlike, but still creepy and scary music, Great way to open it up with the opening credits. Uh, sets the tone. A nice creepy tone. Because we all know what we're getting into when it's called Dolls. It's obvious early on that David and Rosemary really don't like Judy. And they really kind of just treat her as an annoyance. Now obviously with a lot of the characters in this film. Well I mean with all the characters in this film. They're pretty simplistic. You know they're one thing. And that's what they're going to hammer home about that character. Now David and Rosemary obviously horrible people, they're bad parents, they hate, they hate their kid. I mean, well, it's actually biologically David's kid, but Rosemary's like the stepmother, or soon-to-be stepmother is what, it, is what I gather, uh, and they obviously just hate her. Like, they are one-dimensional characters who are just supposed to be pure evil and terrible, so that when they eventually get it from the dolls, well, I mean, David uh, turns into a doll, but in a degree, to a degree, he gets it from the dolls. Uh, but both of them, when they get it, then you're supposed to be like, yeah, fine, good. That They got what they deserve because they're terrible parents. They hate their child. All that jazz. Now, other people like Ralph, you know, you can tell early on that Ralph is going to end up becoming a partial hero, at least, throughout the film, just because of how good-natured he is immediately. And the fact that he gets referred to as being childlike. Just like there's Judy, who's obviously shown in a very innocent, positive light from the get-go because... She's a child, and this film plays a lot on the whole childlike innocence thing, and they they show that by not just having Judy as the actual child with childlike innocence, but they have Ralph as a grown-up who still has that inner childlike innocent innocence and still opines for the di for the days of playing with dolls and owning dolls and being a good person and kind of basically just not being tainted by the world and society which I think is a lot of what this film hits at. Uh, the giant teddy bear scene that they have, which is obviously the daydream for Judy, uh, I think was really awesome. I liked the giant teddy bear at first, but then as soon as like the more feral giant teddy bear kind of rips through the exterior, that's even better. I love that practical effect. It looks great. Uh, the other thing is this, this also serves to set the tracks for, for Judy not necessarily being a reliable narrator as far as the audience goes. Uh, the fact that she's having these daydreams and seeing something crazy like that is supposed to then have the audience later think, well, are these dolls actually winking or moving or coming to life or making noises, or is Judy just having another one of her daydreams? That's why this is laid down so early, so that the audience is kind of questioning things, at least for a little bit, until the murders start happening. Which the first one obviously being, you know, Isabel, where she's getting rammed. Her head's getting rammed up against the wall by the dolls who are off screen. Now at that point, I really wanted to be seeing the dolls kind of like holding her and doing it. But um, 
I was okay with the fact that they didn't do it that way because A, the kill still looked pretty funny, and B, you get a lot of the dolls later on. Now, had you not gotten that much of the dolls later on, I still would have been upset about that first kill scene with Isabel. So, oh, and also the fact that they then follow it up with her having, like, the large doll face with the eyes that fall out. So, yeah. Um, so, oh, the other thing, the other thing, I think that, to, to backpedal just a little bit, that, that teddy bear uh, daydream that Judy has, it also serves one other purpose, which is a bit of a premonition that Judy herself is having that something terrible is inside of that house that they go into where Gabriel and Hillary live. Uh, because remember how reticent she was in the beginning to actually go in there, and a lot of that seemed to be predicated on that terrible daydream she had, which was kind of indicating to her there's something terrible on the way. Rosemary is awfully rude to Gabriel and Hillary when they've taken her in from the storm. Uh, that's just furthering like how bad a person Rosemary is. They establish that early, they hammer that home quite a bit, probably too much in my opinion. But the fact that Hillary is like such a jerk to this old couple who've taken her into their home, they're feeding her, they're giving her a place to stay. They even separated her and her man from the kid for the night so they can have, well, presumably have sex, uh, because they also provide them with wine on their nightstand to have a little bit of wine. So just ungrateful. When the three additional people stumble in, that would be Ralph, Enid, and Isabel. Uh, when they stumble in from the, the storm, I immediately just thought they're here for increased body count. Although, interestingly enough, Ralph didn't end up being that. Obviously, he ends up becoming basically the guardian of Judy by the end of the film because of his childlike nature. Uh, another good guy. Strike one against Isabel is talking about stealing Ralph's wallet. Strike two is her pushing the dolls off the mantle and then falling on the floor just to put her boombox there to listen to loud music. And strike three is when she decides she wants to steal antiques or antiques, if people want to say it that way, uh, from the house. Uh, she got her three strikes, and that's why she is the first to go. She just seems like a bad person. You do see an Enid, though, a little bit. She wants to kind of go along with um, with Isabel's plans and, and how bad Isabel is, but she's also got a little bit of that good nature still in her that she kind of like tries to fight it at first and then she just kind of goes along with things. So she's a kind of more in-between type character. Love the doll noises. I think they're funny and creepy at the same time. That's, and I'm referring to mainly <clears throat> before we're seeing the dolls and you're just kind of like hearing noises behind doors initially. Love that sound. Uh, like I said, it's creepy and it's funny at the same time. Uh, the Isabel scene, yeah, going back to the Isabel kill, it's slapsticky, uh, and that's one of the things that kind of sets the tone for how the film is going to be, uh, not going to be totally serious, it's not all about scares, although they could have tried to play that, the film that way, so I think that at times it really does help the film that it's got that kind of slapsticky humor element to it, but there are times where I feel like it goes a bit too overboard, and that kind of hinders the film at the same time. Uh, hitting the humor versus creep factor, uh, hitting that just right and having the right balance is actually kind of hard to do from a filmmaker and especially from a script writing standpoint. I love the scene of the dolls going crazy on Rosemary, uh, and that's the type of payoff I was really looking for, for when you're finally seeing the dolls in action doing their killing. Uh, love that scene. And once again, the fact that there are so many of these dolls just like dogpiling on Rosemary. They're using hammers. They're using hacksaws. They're just like at her with everything. And it's chaos. And it's a wonderful chaotic scene that gives you that satisfaction of this is what I've endur been enduring part of this film for. And then from there on, it's just, it's pretty fun. I like that there's an inner structure to the dolls. That's another thing. It adds that extra creep factor. When I say inner structure, I mean the fact that they actually have, like, bones and viscera underneath the porcelain that, that they have there. Uh, and it looks super, super cool in the scene where Enid starts busting them open, which is the first time you see that there's actually, actually something under the porcelain of the dolls. Now, I'm assuming that that's just because they are actually people, were people at one point who ended up being turned into dolls, much the way that David gets turned into the new punch doll. That's my assumption on why that's the case. 
I don't know uh, if you feel differently, go ahead and put it in the comments, but that's my best guess. But regardless, the fact that they chose to actually put something underneath that porcelain, I think adds a lot to the film, especially that creepiness going way up. Uh, and apparently originally they were just going to have them be hollow, but then there was a, an idea thrown out, you know, why don't we put something in there? It might kind of enhance it. And I think it definitely did. The aspect of Ralph being young, young at heart should have stayed as sub, subtext. Because there is a time where Ralph and Judy actually are having a conversation about the fact that, oh, maybe I'm okay because I'm, I'm young at heart. It's that time where the dolls were going to attack Ralph, but then Judy asked them not to, and then they were having like this little conference with one another. You could still do that scene, but the fact that Ralph and Judy like outwardly talk about the fact that he's still a child at heart and maybe they'll recognize that and blah, blah. It's too much. Like it's too on the nose. You're insulting your audience by being up, up in their face about that stuff. That should stay subtext. I'm a very big proponent of allow your audience to be intelligent, allow them to use their brains and figure this type of stuff out. I, it really does bother me when the filmmaker feels like they just want to come out and say that type of stuff because it's insulting. It really is like, People would have gotten what was going on there without the characters saying it. Just saying. The ending makes you think that, that think about how many of the numerous dolls there were were actually people at some point. Uh, getting back to the thing where I was saying, I assume that there's an inner structure because of, they were people at, at, a, at a certain point. The characters are pretty stock characters. It's obvious that they're there just to be a vehicle for the dolls to happen. Yeah, I mean, like I said before, it's a very simplistic story. I actually feel like it's kind of a reverse Hansel and Gretel, and part of the reason I say that is, initially in the film, Judy is reading Hansel and Gretel in the car. Then, when we get to the house, and she's going to eat, uh, what's her name, uh, Hillary, the, the old lady, uh, checks Judy, much like the witch in Hansel and Gretel does, checks her finger to see how skinny she is, and that she needs to get more meat on her bones. Then there's a reference later on where they're talking about Hansel and Gretel. And then I, it just got me thinking because of that, all those references to Hansel and Gretel, why it's a reverse is because it's more of a Hansel and Gretel to Rosemary and David in the sense that in Hansel and Gretel, you know, you're pulling these kids in to kill and eat them by having something enticing out there, which is a house made of candy. Now, in this instance, it is bringing Rosemary and David in because it's a place to seek refuge from the storm, which they say is happening like all the time. That's what Hillary and Gabriel say. Uh, so it's a place for refuge. It's a place to get food. It's a place to get a break from their child. That's the biggest thing. So all these things are very inviting, very enticing to them, but it obviously is leading them and probably intentionally leading them to their deaths, much like Hansel and Gretel. Because you get that idea that that's what Gabriel and Hillary are about, is they're about maintaining the childhood innocence. And anyone who comes by their path intentionally, uh, by having people get stuck outside of their house and bringing them in, they kind of evaluate the person and decide, should these people be killed? Or more importantly, the dolls will decide, should these people be killed? I'm sure they didn't initially expect Ralph to to not be killed. This could have been more successful if they toned down the wacky nature of the film because the dolls actually are scary. I totally agree with that. I think the film actually ended up making like one and a half million dollars. I think it was like a budget of two million and it made like 3.5. So they made like 1.5 mil. Obviously, this is about maintaining the innocence of a child instead of becoming an adult corrupted by the ills of society. Like I said, that's Judy and that's Ralph. And you would assume that Judy would be, especially after this, on the trajectory of Ralph himself of staying a child at heart even when she grows up. Now, this is the part where I'm going to tell you that in, that at one point, Stuart Gordon had plans to do a sequel. It just never ended up coming to fruition. So let me tell you what his sequel idea was. Uh, Judy and Ralph were going to go to Boston. Ralph was going to marry Judy's mother and then one day, Judy was going to end up receiving a package from England, or I, I think it was specifically London, and it would have two dolls in, the, in it who resembled Hillary and Gabriel. I think that's a good premise to kind of start a sequel, 
And who knows, you know, maybe someone else could pick it up and do it. I know Charles Band could make that happen. I don't know. Is Brian Usna still alive? He could be involved. I don't know. But anyway, uh, my thoughts, I told you I was going to rate this two ways. So as just an overall film out of five stars with half stars in play, I mean, it's a two star film. I was between one and a half and two, but I think with all the time and money they put into those dolls, I think it, I'd give it a two. Uh, as far as like a so bad it's good type film, I think it gets to like a 3.5 actually. I'd put it there. It, it's a fun time in a bad way. And um, yeah, I could see myself watching it again. But I was between three and three and a half on that. But I'm going to give it the, the three and a half. So would love to hear your thoughts on dolls. Go ahead and put comments down there. Did you love it? Did you hate it? Are you in between? Just want to know. And also, this was my first viewing of it. So how many times have you watched it? And has it gotten better over time? Because that's what I want to know. Or with multiple views, basically. So anyway, um, like I said, comments. Do me a quick favor. Hit subscribe. I'm getting very close at this point. Actually, when I'm, re when I'm doing this, I'm getting close to 1,000 subscribers, which is a cool milestone that I really want to hit for, um, you know, just for the milestone to be like, look, I did this. Uh, also, when you do subscribe, it really does show me that you appreciate the, the uh, videos that I'm putting out and the talk that I'm doing about these films. So, yeah, I mean, really, I started this channel just to build a nerdy horror community, and I'm still looking to do that. And that's the other reason that I love having comments on these videos so that I can interact with you about nerdy horror stuff. So do that for me. If you are going to subscribe, please hit the notification bell button because uh, that way you'll know when I'm putting up new videos as well. And the other thing is subscribing costs you nothing. It's quick, it's painless, and you're doing me a favor. But anyway, regardless, I thank you for taking your time to check this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.